<clears throat> when did when did you guys start the uh, Santa Cruz Surf Club, and who was who was the uh, person who was the creative force behind that? I can pick that up and point to the young man that really got things going in junior high school, yeah. and the fellows made their boards uh, in the school shops, and we got a few local early day guys got, got together that enjoyed surfing and formed the club and as early as 1936 it was active in the uh, late 30s and through the 40s the, the club was but harry one of the very first and bob came in a little, a little later and there were 27 members totally and i was the last to, you were number 27? I was number 27 because I'm younger. These guys are old guys. Uh, why, why only 27? Did something happen that... No, I don't know. The war uh, that happened then? Or? I, I think we started to... People were mar getting married and all... The war. The war. The war. I guess most of the guys were in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah, was the last one. But Harry was the one at high school that would say, surf's up, and about 20 guys would leave, the, leave school and away we went. Oh my gosh. So did you, was it easy to find somebody to surf with back then? Or? No. no it, there was 20 guys maybe, and, a, and that was yeah, a unit. On, on that subject, I, I live in a senior center, and uh, a new sister just moved in that used to be a teacher in the 60s back here at uh, Holy Cross. And she said she used to have trouble keeping the guys after school, after class, because they were all surfers, the bell rang, and they were gone. Some <laughs> things never change. That's, that's amazing. Now, what year was, was all this happening? It was like the 1940s, 1930s? Well, our club was very proper in the late 30s and 40s. Wow. Yes, of course, the war, 1940, 1941, broke us all up. And a lot of guys didn't come back. Nobody got killed, but didn't come back. Married, college, working, going to college going to college out of town. Now, Harry, you were in the Coast Guard? Or, I remember yeah, I was Bob there. was telling, telling a story one time about, about your, your uh, tour of duty in San... I was in the uh, United States Coast Guard and got stationed in my hometown. 28 months out of 38 in the service, 28 months of it was right in Santa Cruz. Slipping eight ashore, what they call subsistence at port and starboard duty, 24 hours on, 24 hours off. Let me explain it, Harry. You're, you're not doing a good, good job of telling your own life story. It was day on, day off. The day he was on duty, he had to get up early and check out all the fishing boats going on. And then this, they were all out, and he had nothing to do except go lie on the beach with the rest of the surfers. The next day, when he was, it was time for him to be off duty, where was he? He was on the beach with all the surfers. He did that during the war. Oh, he lived at home and got subsistency for living at home. And he complained every day that he had tough duty. <laughs> it, 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 you interrupt me if I told a lie. <laughs> This was like a transition time, 30s and 40s. They were going from, I, I remember uh, there was a lot of redwoods around back then, I, I've, I've heard. They were uh, transitioning into the hollows and the balsas, lighter, lighter weight solid boards. Uh, the balsas wasn't until after the war to get the balsa wood out of the old life rafts. From surplus. Balsa with a Redwood stringer. So with that, those were the pl uh, planks. Planks, they were the, called uh, planks. The, the planks came in and they were really quite heavy. Yeah, they were. Um, 
with their lemon. The balsa wood. was the popular thing because it was a lighter wood. Mm -hmm. A lot lighter than redwood. Yeah. But it was a stringer of, of redwood yeah. and then balsa, I mean, the length of the board. Yeah. So would, they would laminate, laminate. laminate it together. Yeah. Those and they were still heavy, too. though. They're very heavy. Oh, well, yeah. the, around 100 pounds. Yeah. Some of them are more, some of them are a little less, but around 100 pounds. Go ahead. Sorry. The board, uh, uh, the surfing sculptor, the model was uh, yeah, yeah. Richie Thompson's plane. Oh, was it? Yeah. So if you see that surfing sculptor out on West Cliff, that uh, board was uh, really. Well, it's enlarged a little bit, it wasn't quite that big, but the shape, and it was taken from uh, a surf club member, Richie Thompson's plank. So that's what a plank looks like. That's a beautiful sculpture. You guys are responsible for that, the Santa Cruz Surf Club. That was a lot of work. I mean, Doug and I were co-chairman of that thing, but everybody pitched in the race. Did that cost 75000 I think so. About 75000 which we thought it was going to be about 15,000 maybe when we de service decided to do that. But by the time we got permission from the city and the permits and the thing done, it went from that to about 75,000. Who sold all the t-shirts? Uh, Philco and Bob and uh, uh, Jack O'Neill yeah. uh, donated the shirts and then Phyllis is she was the one that sold those. And Bob Gillis yeah. sold them thousands of dollars worth of Oh, yeah, things. and everybody popped in some money and yeah. merchants donated to it. A contribution. Well, we all did. This yeah. was in the 80, 1980s? That was in 1992. We had the dedication on May 23rd of 1992 and actually it commenced in. Uh, I think around 87 or 88. Yeah. And the first, first meeting was down at my office in the late afternoon. We had coffee and cookies. I'm going to interrupt that because I was just thinking, of Doug, you never mentioned about your hamburger stand on Beach Street. You used to have a hamburger stand. When, when was that? Uh, June, July, and August of 19. 55. You flipped a pretty good hamburger. <laughs> anyway, that was uh, just, uh, I had been lifeguarding earlier before I went on my active duty with the Navy and uh, when I came back, I, I thought I'd try a little business rather before I went back to college for my master's uh, in Cal Poly. Anyway, that's quite an experience. Yeah. Well, one of your members, is it Murray, used to be part of a, a show at the boardwalk? Yeah, they, Where you, they did the uh, fire dive. Yeah, uh, Harry Murray, Don Patterson. <laughs> Freddie Quadras. Freddie Quadras. Freddie Quadras, Bill Nitterdale. Uh, but Several of the members Bos were uh, the Don Club Bosco members. Patterson are all members of the water carnival doing diving, fire diving, swimming, uh, clown acrobatics, and canoe, canoe and fights. I remember a story about Harry Murray who was doing a fire dive or something and well, he couldn't let go of the Oh, well, that was that was from the top of the casino to the pleasure end of the pleasure fair slide for life, and they even did it on fire. So one you're... one time, Bosco couldn't let he, he hands were burning, but he couldn't let go until he got out over the water to let go of Harry Murray. Now that was the, the cable from. If you next time you go down by the boardwalk and you look up the highest point on the main building, the Coconut Grove, and from that it was up Pleasure Pier out there, 100 yards, 200. Yards. Uh, it was about a third of the length of the wharf, wow. uh, okay. and yeah. and it came out uh, 
close to the center of the boardwalk. Sure. And uh, speedboat rides, and stag heroes ran things out there. And the water pipe uh, for the salt water for the plunge. For the plunge, uh, they warmed the salt water and held that pipe. And then, of course, when you spoke about the um, slide for life, they had a little platform on the top of the coconut grove up there where they all started in a wire that went out to the end of the pleasure pier. And it came over across the building, across the beach, near the bandstand, and on out to the end. And Bosco Patterson would ride that thing with Harry Mayo hanging on his legs. Not Harry Mayo. I mean, uh, Harry Murray. And, uh, Not me. Uh, they asked they let go just before they hit the wharf, the end of the wharf. Yeah. Oh, really? So the night with them on fire was quite a spectacular thing. Yeah. So he actually lit himself on fire? Oh, yeah. They were lit. They were soaking, they wrapped them in cloth. Burlap. Burlap. And soaked in kerosene, I guess, or something. Yeah. And, and he then, would ride the trolley all the way out yeah. to the, the, the water. Had a combination of the of the uh, Aquacade, they sold tickets, of course, for the, in the plunge. There were seats all around, I seat several hundred people in there, and it was, it was a paid deal to go in and see the water carnival. And the grand finale was uh, Bosco Patterson coming out in the fire dive into the plunge. From a tower on top, he'd come through a Above hole in the, the roof. They could have fallen on the roof. And that's where he dove through. From it. And they'd light him. He was wrapped in uh, burlap and soaked in kerosene. <laughs> they'd fire him and he'd, he'd take off. It was very, very exciting. Yeah. Amazing. Well, you wouldn't do that today. Oh, yeah. sure. No. No. Would, have, no. would, would have something to say about I it. I don't. You'd be hard getting a permit for that. So uh, now, I've heard rumors that, that Harry was was one of the few surfers in the uh, Santa Cruz Surf Club that didn't know how to swim. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I think he knew a little bit well, how to swim or he wouldn't be with us. He could, he could make his way through the water? I, I think so. I think he was, he's here, isn't he? He didn't drown. Yeah. And he I had this, uh, a paddle board that had the wrong size plug in yeah. it or something? Well, I'll tell it anyway. So it was one of these days it was real, real foggy out there, very, very foggy. And Harry and I decided to go out. I think I don't remember anybody else around, particularly. So we go in in the fog. We both get our boards out of the board house, and he he picked a different board. Those old boards, you know, they had a cork in it so you could get the water out of them because they you made them yourself and they leaked a little bit. So we take off, Harry and I together paddle out, and when I look around, I can't see Harry. I take off, take a ride, and I come back. When I come back, I'm going out. I still don't see Harry through the fog. And then I hear him. He says, help, help. Like two or three times, I say, Harry, over here. And I look over right about where the serving statue is now. There was a cave. And Harry, I paddle over, and there Harry is. I can see him through the through the fog. He's boards down, and he's crunk, he's like this, <laughs> just shivering like that. And what had happened? The, the board he took out had a cork on both ends, and he didn't notice that. So he put a cork on one end, and went out. So as soon as he hit the water, the wa the water is going in the end of the board. So before he even got all the way out, it filled with water. So. I got in there with him, and he could hardly move. But to, and the, there was suction there from the from the board on the sand. It took us both to pop that thing loose and get it up and get him out of there and get him on the board and push him in and got in. So that's uh, they had a special meeting of the surfing club, and they were going to disband me from the club because they really weren't sure that I should have saved him. <laughs> True story. Uh, how do you respond to that, Harry? <laughs> they never did forgive him. <laughs> you know, as I look back on it, 
Um, that was a wonderful scene down there at Cowles Beach because our clubhouse became the hub of surfing for Northern California. It had a volleyball court out in front, nice deck out in front, and a place to store some things inside, and a board house, and hundreds and hundreds of people on the beach. It, it seemed to be more popular back in those days, didn't it? Uh, Cowles well, it was, was amazing, the yeah. beach to, yeah. for the young people to, to oh, attend. It, it was packed. Yeah. yeah, and of course that's where the surf was, and it was, it was wonderful. Because you mentioned cars earlier. How we carried the boards and so on. All right. What? How did you guys move? From well, some of the guys had the turtleback cars, and uh, I don't think there was a surf rack in the early days. I had a flat roof 1929 four-door Chevy, flat roof, and I'd tie it up in the computer windows, but. Um, and also on the highway, you see somebody with a surfboard in the car, you'd pull over and talk. You know, it was kind of unique. Yeah. Yeah. We had some highway surfers put the boards on the roof of their cars, drive over, never put them in the water. Just highway surfers. <laughs> <laughs> Weekend warriors. So, what do you guys think about uh, the the history of Santa Cruz is changing right now because of the the work that Kim Stoner and Jeff Dunn and uh, Mac Reed finding out that that there were Hawaiian Hawaiian princes surfing here. 130 years ago, the trigger for this whole thing about the three princes. Yeah, he went to Hawaii and got permission to go to a warehouse and look at these boards. Took pictures and measurements and everything. It's kind of changed the history. You're a part of uh, the town that actually started the, the whole surfing scene on, in America. Well, this was it in Northern California. Uh, Southern California people actually surfed, I think, a little bit sooner. Uh, Santa Nofri, uh, a spot, there's a club down there, and Malibu. Well, would it be true that the princes were the first surfers? In, in the United States, in the United that we know States. of, in 1885. So it started in, so it started in California. It started yeah, it started. On the San Lorenzo River. Right down at the point. And then those rascals down south tried to get away with it. Yeah, and it was uh, there spot. July of uh, 1885 when the three princes. Well, Huntington, when they finished his railroad, hired a guy from Hawaii to come and surf down south. And they'd look at it as that's the first surfing. Mm -hmm. But it princess surfed here way before that. Don't like to stress on the 